Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to colleagues from different countries. Welcome to this webinar masterclass on NFT and financial fraud prevention organized jointly with UNIC, University of Nicosia in Cyprus and City University of London in the U United Kingdom. My name is Professor Rajkumar Roy. I'm the Executive Dean of the School of Science and Technology. And I am here to welcome you to present this masterclass in very important topic of NFT, non-fungible tokens. I know that you will hear about state-of-the-art research in this area in a few moments. But it is also important to discuss how NFT is also challenging us. For, for example, there is a recent report which talks about Her Majesty's HMRC organization has actually identified first NFT is the first law, and in, law enforcement organization in, in the country in United Kingdom who has seized one NFT because of lack of clarity on the source of that NFT and whether it's real. So in NFT, there are challenges that's coming. And I hope this masterclass will give you ideas first about what is NFT in general, but then how it is used and what are the practical problems of non-fungible tokens. It's growing very fast. It's everybody talks about its promise, but in reality, as colleagues in business and we at universities who research and develop new businesses with NFTs, we are interested on threats, risks with NFT as well. We need to understand that better. There is another whole area of counterfeits. How do we protect against counterfeits, whether it's fashionable products or major engineering components, engineering systems? How can we protect them with NFT is a major challenge as well. You know, there are lots of billions of pounds or dollars are wasted in managing obsolescence in different industrial sectors around the world, in Europe, in UK, in Europe, in US, and around the world. Can NFT give a solution for that, to protect identity of components so that we can understand which component is original? I think in masterclass today, you will hear some thought provoking ideas. And then after the two talks, we will have half an hour, approximately half an hour session where you can ask questions in the Q and A please, or you can put it in the chat. I think you are using chat mostly. So it will be fantastic if you want to put your questions as you listen to the speakers, please add your questions in the chat and then we will pick up some of those and try to answer. Well, panel members will try to answer. Now let me introduce our first speaker 
for this master class. Dr. Andrea Baron Kelly is going to talk about his NFT based research. He is an associate professor in mathematics at City University of London. And at the same time, he is also working as token economy team lead at Alan Turing Institute. His research shapes are shaped by socio-technical systems we inhabit using data science, mathematical modeling, and lab experiments with human subjects. He has published in very high profile journals. And he, has also, he was also recognized as 2019 Young Scientist Award for Socio and Econophysics by German Physical Society. With that, I would like to welcome Andrea. Thank you very much. Raj, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm very happy. Now I will share my screen with the slides on it and uh, this should be smooth. Here we go. I hope you can see this. Uh, also at this point, I will not uh, basically see anything anymore. So if there is interruption also from the technical side, please stop me with voice probably. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. As Raj was saying, uh, what my team and I and collaborators have done has been mapping the NFT ecosystem. So we had been working for a good time on the space of cryptocurrencies, and we were somehow ready when the NFT exploded to go and look what was happening there. So I will not focus too much on the fraud part in my talk, that's more for the second talk, but uh, the point is that it's important to be aware of what's going on, particularly for what concerns, for example, dynamics of price formation, in order to have a benchmark against which we can test uh, models or automatic fraud detection algorithms. So my talk is structured in two parts, which correspond to two papers we have put out. A first mapping. So this is a paper that appeared in October where we actually set out to look several dimensions of the NFT ecosystem. And then uh, zooming in, in how rarity shapes the dynamics of prices there. So let's start with the first one. Well, the first one, you know the story, but uh, I wanted to be quite introductory in my talk, allowing for different uh, levels of knowledge of NFTs. So the big bang uh, of NFT for from the point of view of public attention was the uh, sale of a Beeple, an artist called Beeple price, a, a piece uh, in March last year that sold for $69 million. And of course, making him the, the, the third most uh, expensive artist alive and uh, in an auction that took place at Christie's. So this is, the, the payment was done in Ether, and this was what brought a massive attention on the media of the space. So of course, NFTs are older than that. They originated with CryptoKitties, and even before, so 2017, but even before. I'm not going into the history. I really like this um, DR newspaper podcast from 26 February 2021, so before that auction. Uh, which is also the opening line of our paper, which is what WTF are NFTs. So there was this, this really this uh, surprise from the more traditional art world at the arrival of this technology. Why crypto is dominating the art market already in February before the auction. For those of you who don't know the art newspaper, it's, it's quite a serious publication. And uh, so the title is particularly ironic. So again, we're catering for a set of 
different backgrounds here. Just a very quick uh, recap on what NFTs are in layman language. An NFT is a unit of data stored on a blockchain, so it's easy. The important point is that it can be associated with digital and non-digital objects. So there is typically a link uh, or a picture of something. And um, the important thing is that thanks to the blockchain technology, but we don't need to go into the technicalities here, an NFT answers in, in an unequivocal way to such questions as who owns, previously owned, and created the NFT. So it provides a way to assess authenticity and originality and property in digital age, in the digital age, and in doing so, it covers to uh, several needs of the online world, for sure, of the digital world. And that's a reason for the explosion. So in our first paper, which you see referenced down, uh, published in scientific reports in 2001, we checked several dimensions. So for example, we wondered, uh, we concentrated on pictures, so on visual NFTs, not only restricted to art, as we will see. And so, for example, we wondered about uh, the visual homogeneity across categories and collection, how network of, trader, of traders are made, building the networks of co-traded NFTs, and uh, seeing whether some market trends could be somehow anticipated. Now, we have uh, realized a video that is introductory to uh, go with the paper. And it's just four minutes. I guess it sets well as an introduction to this event and in general to NFTs and our results. So I will, I will propose it to you. Before that, to give you a scale of what our analysis was, we analyzed 4.7 million NFTs uh, who were exchanged 6.1 million transactions for 1 billion. This is just the big bang of the whole movement. So our analysis here stops in May 2021. The analysis I will offer you, propose to you in the second part on the other end is up until one month ago. And you see we have 160 cryptos, 360,000 buyers, and more or less a similar number of sellers and thousands of collections. So let's see uh, how the broadcasting of the videos go. I know that typically at the beginning, it's a little bit noisy and then stabilizes. Let's hope it does it also in this case. Non-fungible tokens or NFTs became very popular in early 2021 when digital images started to be sold for tens of millions of dollars. Overall, the value of their market has now surpassed $2 billion. But what exactly are NFTs and why are they so popular? Take this digital image of a 24 by 24 pixelated punky looking girl named 7610. It was generated by an algorithm and uploaded on the internet. So everyone can make their own copy of it, downloading it or taking a screenshot. But if everyone can have it, who actually owns it? The NFT is a new technology that allows people to own the original copy of a digital item, such as an image, video, and text. This is possible thanks to the underlying blockchain technology that certifies the property of digital objects through so-called smart contracts. The fact that a digital item can be owned means that they can be traded, and 2021 witnessed the explosion of this market. To chart the birth and evolution of this phenomenon, a new study published in scientific reports 
looks at a large data set, including 4.7 million NFTs exchanged by more than 500,000 buyers and sellers. In this network, spheres represent traders, while links connecting them represent the trade of an NFT. Spheres are colored according to the preferred items they trade. Large spheres, with many surrounding links, indicate very active traders. Prices on the NFT market are very heterogeneous. Only the top 1% of objects are traded for more than $1,500, but 75% of them are sold for less than $15. But what determines the sale price of an NFT? The study considered three factors. One, visual characteristics. Two, previous sales of related NFTs and three, the popularity of buyers and sellers. Visual features are assessed using sophisticated computer vision techniques that dissect the visual properties of each object to find similarities among them. Previous sales are assessed by considering the market history of items from the same collection. The popularity of traders is assessed by looking at the network formed by millions of trades extracted from the blockchain to identify important players. The study found that visual features, previous prices, and market social network all play a role in determining the price of an NFT. Previous sales of related NFTs were consistently important. Visual features are important determinants of the price, especially for art. The network effect is predominant for objects sold in virtual worlds, especially gaming. By considering these three aspects, NFT prices can be predicted with good accuracy, as high as 70%. NFTs have revolutionized the way in which digital content is produced and exchanged. This study was the first to unveil the complexity of their market. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video. The video is also an abstract for what I'm telling you in the next 10 minutes or so. So the first thing we did was uh, just really looking at uh, the market in time. So if you look here, we divided all the NFTs in a number of categories, such as art, collectible, games, metaverse, other, and utility which were actually proposed by the website uh, nonfungible.com. So we didn't do them. Within each of this category, and I'm on the column on the left, panel A, we have different uh, collections, which are typically created by the same creator. They share some visual features or some, uh, some generating algorithm. They have something in common. And then we looked, and let's just focus on panel B, at the daily volume in US dollars. Notice the logarithmic scale on the y-axis. So after 2021, you really see a dramatic jump, especially at the beginning in the category of art, which as we anticipated was the one like uh, marking the popularization of NFT. We then checked the several statistical distribution for this market. And you see in particular prices, sales, and collections. There is uh, each, the top row is for the aggregated measure. The bottom row is for different categories. And you see in every case, we have heavy tails. So look, for example, at the prices. Well, you have that the vast majority of uh, NFTs have actually a very low mean asset price, less than $1 or one euro. However, few of them have a huge uh, price in this distribution, which remains a uh, uh, power law somehow. The same is for the number of sales. The vast majority say, uh, sold only once. However, few of them collected the hundreds or even thousands sales. And the same, it's true for collection, sales per collection. Most collections are actually basically unsold, but few collection collect more than 100,000 sales. So this, this uh, heterogeneity characterizes the market. 
The take home message of this heterogeneity, if you want a number, for example, is that 75% of NFTs sold for less than $15 in our data set. And pay attention, we only considered NFTs who were sold at least once. So this is already like a, a subset of NFTs who somehow, that somehow had a certain success. As the video anticipated, once you have transactions between NFTs, you can build a network of trade where each node is a trader and a link between two users, two individuals, two nodes exists if they exchange one NFT. Superficially, of course, there is much more to say and we are actually digging into this at this point. You can see that uh, traders tend to be clustered even just visually. So those specialized in arts, are with a subset of those specialized in CryptoPunk. Hash masks is another case, super rare. These are different markets. This is only for what concern art, okay? The dual of this is a network of NFTs where the nodes are NFTs themselves and they are linked once they have been uh, owned at a certain point in time by the same owner. Okay, so a link is created here from an NFT to another when a buyer, a buyer, a buyer purchases the former and then the latter with no purchases between the two. So there is also a temporal dimension. You can say, why? Well, this is just a curiosity. Well, it's a little bit more than a curiosity uh, because as we will see, this contains precious information. For example, if you want to do an exercise of price prediction. Also, the networks are heterogeneous. So what is panel A here? Well, strength is the number of trades you have made while you have the, the probability distribution on the Y. So once again, you see that the vast majority of traders have done one or very few transactions. However, there is a fraction of them, a small fraction of them who have done more than a thousand or even a hundred thousand transactions. This is uh, significant because these are hubs. So are they gateway to the market? If, if so, the market is first of all, very concentrated. Second, able to, uh, these people may be able to even manipulate the market. And in fact, we found that the top 10% of buyer seller pairs contributes to the total number of transactions as much as the remaining 90%. Okay, so if you want to do half and half, you go to the top 10% of buyers. Traders tend to be specialized. This is uh, the percentage of trades they do in their top collection, the top line. And you see that particularly very active traders tend to be very specialized. That is, they have 100% or 90% of their transaction in the top collection. This is also interesting. And collections are ecosystems in themselves, like CryptoPunks, and we will see this also later. NFTs in large collection, if you look at the dual for community. Okay, so intercollection link in the NFT network are actually few. So once again, large collection tend to be world within the NFT world. Then we analyze them just to give you an idea. Of course, I cannot go into detail, the visual feature. So we look at the steps, they are numbered. We took, for example, uh, an initial data set with all the figure. We eliminated all duplication and duplicated. And then in number three, we had this clean data set. This clean data set is given to AlexNet, which is a neural network that extracts a vector of 40,000 values, more or less. And with this representation, each figure becomes a vector in a multidimensional space. And then you can cluster these vectors or at least doing the principal component analysis. And the nice thing is that the principal component analysis allows you to uh, identify with just three components, different categories of art. So not collections, which would be trivial and look at the figure on the right, but uh, Categories. So NFTs connected to games are typically closer to one another than NFTs connected to art, which in their turn are closer to one another. 
Again, if I were telling you that a CryptoPunk is more similar to a CryptoPunk than to a board ape, that would be trivial. This is, we judge, less trivial. We then looked at up and down of prices, and these are different uh, collections where you have the x-axis, that is time. And you see, you have a dot, which is red if the price of a new sale has gone down, a gray one if it has been more or less the same, or a blue for uh, a, a price up. Why is this important? Because what our goal was then to do a simple exercise of price prediction. So what we did was this, as anticipated in the video, so I will not go into details because we, don't, we have only a finite time and I want to tell you about something more in detail. But we fitted a linear regression to estimate the price of primary and secondary sales from different sets of features. So we gave it the network centrality of buyer and seller. And forget the technicality. The question is, is the network centrality of buyers and seller somehow predictor, a predictor of the price? By network centrality, I just consider things like the degree, how active are the, the, the seller in particular. The PCA, the principal component analysis of the visual features. So is that visual analysis a predictor of the price? The probability that there will be a sale within a collection, of course, I mean, you can say that if collections are highly traded, then this P probably will inform uh, the price and the past prices of objects in the collection. So this is the easy guess, and it's the, a new crypto punk has been sold. What's the best guess for the price of that crypto bank? Well, the price of the crypto banks sold in the last week. And in fact, as you can say for primary sale, for secondary sale prices, for example, panel B, the median price is the best predictor of price. What's interesting, however, is that for art, visual features allow you to improve the uh, forecast significantly. Well, this is not true for other categories. For gaming, on the other hand, the network of uh, trade is a good descriptor. And of course, this is a very, if you want also naive exercise, things could be refined. But the important thing is that we wanted to show the complexity of this ecosystem with these different features having a role. So central players in the market. So, What's, what's to be done? How can this inform an analysis on the uh, illicit trade, for example? Are there dodgy patterns? Do I find central players in the market that significantly, for example, do something strange and different from the others? How can we best predict success? So what's the role of market creator and visual features more in detail? particularly the network we have just started scheming. Are there communities of people who trade this more significantly? And this is the first part. The second, and this is the paper, the paper got also quite a good coverage, it's been downloaded 130,000 times, uh, simply because, well, simply, at least because it was unquestionably the first one. And then let's go to rarity. So let's zoom in a little bit. So, NFTs are often in collections, as I mentioned. We have seen CryptoPunks in the video. Within this collection, some items are rarer than others, and I will tell you why. We show that rarer NFTs are typically more expensive, are traded less often, are better investment, that is not only they are more expensive, but they also give you higher return on investment, and are less risky, that is they typically uh, protect you against the uh, risk of a loss. So this is our data set here. We have 3.7 million trades, 1.3 million NFTs, and 410 collections. And the data in this case are up until April 2022. That is two months ago. So let me tell you about rarity. So you have CryptoPunks. CryptoPunks, you have 10,000 of these little images. How are they created? They have a template plus attributes with different values. For example, 
This is the attribute fascial hair. Now you see the fascial hair can be of different kinds. Can be a shadow beard, a mutton chops, a goat beard, a normal beard, and up to the big beard, big beard, sorry. Bird is another thing. And you see that you have a certain rarity score that I will define. So not all beard are the same. So how do you measure the rarity? Well, it's very simple. You count for an NFT, for a trait, you count how many NFTs have that trait, okay? And then you take the inverse. So if there is only one NFT with that trait, the trait is very rare. So the rarity will be big because few NFTs have the trait. The rarity score of an NFT on the other end, not on a trait, not only on the beard, is just the sum of the rarity of everything, that of all the traits of an NFT. So let's see an example. In this, you have not two random examples, but you have on the left, the least rare crypto bank, which has a total rarity score of 44.49. And the most rare, the rarest NFT in the collection, which is, which has a rarity score of 10,000 plus. And you see, because it has blemishes, which is quite rare, the eyes as a, uh, as a glass with shades, as the big beard we were mentioning before, as a top hat, as a sort of very cool stuff, which the other didn't have. So, How's the, our data set? Let's look at the top. Typically, a collection in our data set has around 10,000 NFTs. Of course, it's not strictly the case, and you have a distribution around that. Typically, there are 10 attributes, and typically, there are 10 tra 100 traits per attribute. What do I mean? An attribute is the beard, and there are typically 100 kinds of beard. And the market is this, you have the number of sales, the majority of them uh, has more than 1,000 sale. Okay, so 50% of them are more than 5,000 sales. And let's do now the rarity distribution. So let's focus on the top row here. What is this? On the x-axis, you have the rarity score as we have defined, normalized to 100. And you see that in all cases, you have that the majority of NFTs are non-rare. So you have that the curve is high on the y-axis on the left of the x-axis. And then you have a degrading thing. Now you would say, well, but this is trivial because you are telling me that rare objects, rare NFTs are fewer than non-rare NFTs. True, but I'm telling you that this is way above random, okay? So this could be much more homogeneous when you design a collection. While in all our collection, this is quite heterogeneous. In the bottom X, you have a way of quantifying this slope is the correlation coefficient. And you see that 86% of collection have a Spearman rank smaller than minus 0.2, meaning that they are significantly heterogeneous. Remember, they could be uniform because you are designing them. Now, we split the asset into quantiles, okay, with respect to the rarity score. So we will have that, take the main figure here, that at 100, you have the top most rare NFTs. And then in each bin, you have the same number of NFTs. Why we do this? To be able to compare different collections. And what you see is that you have, uh, in all cases, you have in these figures, the price on the Y and the rarity quantile on the X, you have that the price grows when X grows. So when things are more rare. And if you take the main one, you can see that up until 70 or 80% of NFTs, the price is more or less flat. And then you have this jump that goes up quite steeply. And again, notice the logarithmic scale on the X. So it goes up by a factor of two, four, or even more. 
they are sold less often. This is the number of sale per rarity quantile. And you see that the curve decreases this time because rarer items are sold for higher price, but less often. They give you also higher returns. What is a return here? Is the price of when you basically sell it minus the price of when you bought it, normalized to the price when you bought it, okay? And you see that the median return is significantly higher, up to four times higher for the most rare items. This is uh, consistent across collections. So this is a pattern that we observe over and over again. In the instance also before, you have uh, a characterization, a mathematical characterization of this, with, in which I don't want to go now, but just to say that this is not a random pattern, you, you can quantify this. And they're also less risky. So this is the percentage of trades that give origin to a negative return versus rarity quantile. First of all, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the baseline is above 35%. So, Typically, 35% of trades are at a loss. Now, of course, you can say this is people transferring from one wallet to the other. We don't know this. Uh, it's hard to believe that the signal is dominated by these trades, also by speaking with experts in, in blockchain intelligence. And, but in any case, once again, you see that the, there is a drop, significant drop from 35% to 25%. So, Rare NFTs are more expensive, sell less often, yield higher return of investment, and are less risky. The, and this is a nice thing to conclude. The effect is more pronounced for the, it, all these effects are way more pronounced for the top 10% rare NFTs. What does it mean? That the bottom 90%, if you want, are more fungible from the point of view of the market. So, it, it, it is true that they are non-fungible NFTs and you can distinguish one from the other. But from the point of view of the market, the distinction actually translates into something concrete for the rarer NFT, the rarest NFTs. That is, if you have the 10th rarest NFTs or 100 rarest NFTs, it does make a difference on average. On the other end, if you have the 85th percent rarest, or the 90% rarest, it doesn't really make a, a difference. So you have a part of the market which is non-fungible and the other one which is crypto-like. Okay, I bought a crypto punk. which one? It doesn't matter, one of the bulk. Next steps, who does the trades? As I anticipated before, there is a lot to observe there. How concentrated is the market? So in how many hands, are these NFTs and how many ants actually trade these NFTs? And therefore, how easy it is to manipulate? And in, if it's easy to manipulate, you can see that also the financial fraud is easier. And this is all. I think I just stayed in, in, in time or maybe exceeded by a little bit. So I give the floor back, stopping sharing the screen. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have several questions from your presentation, which we'll pick, we will pick up in the discussion section. Thank you very much to colleagues who are writing uh, questions in the chat. So please continue to do that. And in the meantime, let me introduce Dr. Harris Savides. He's a lawyer and partner at Stelios Americanos one of the largest full service law firm in Cyprus. He's also lecturer at the University of Nicosia, where he has been a faculty member of the law school for a number of years and of the Department of Digital Innovation of the Business School since 2020. He is also a member of the Institute for the Future of University of Nicosia, and Sula is here. She is the director of the Institute for the Future. Dr. Savides or Harris 
has an interest and practice include, among others, regulatory framework of digital services and digital markets. So very different angle to the whole area of NFT he will talk about. And he is a legal advisor to investment funds, investment, um, especially around crypto asset services providers. Furthermore, he's an expert panel member of the European Union Blockchain Observatory and Forum, member of the Cyprus Investment Funds Association and the Technology Committee of the Cyprus Bar Association. With that introduction, Harris, over to you. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Um, I'm really pleased uh, being with you today and uh, many thanks to uh, our participants. I hope they will enjoy this, um, this class. Uh, please allow me to share my screen now and start my presentation. Right, okay. Um, I hope you, you can see uh, the presentation. Um, okay. Yes, everything is fine. It's is. fine, thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. So um, I have to say that uh, my experience so far speaking about blockchain, crypto, uh, NFTs, any, uh, anything in this uh, exciting growing still niche market, uh, is that uh, lawyers speak only about problems. And unfortunately, uh, this is not an exception for, for today because uh, apparently what we are doing uh, since I remember myself in this uh, industry, uh, uh, we just share with people what we think it is legal or illegal. So, um, I try uh, today, I will try today to uh, at least outline a bit the situation about NFTs from uh, an entirely different perspective uh, from what uh, Andreas uh, presented before. Uh, apparently it's gonna be the legal side of things, the, uh, the regulations. And I, I would say also, uh, it is important to see up to what level NFTs have disrupted legal uh, sector. Um, I don't. I, uh, I don't think that it is the other way around in this case, or at least uh, at the moment. I, I haven't seen anything from the legal sector disrupting the development of NFTs. Uh, they just fuel more and more challenges uh, for lawyers. So let's have a look at, at this topic and see. Uh, what conclusions we can get uh, from this. Okay, I'll start first of all speaking about the massive business trend that uh, we experienced since uh, 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 the advent of, of blockchain technology and I refer to asset tokenization. There is definitely a, a business trend that is growing uh, incrementally across uh, the globe. Uh, we've seen a lot, we, we, there are a lot of projects, not just product, projects, uh, a lot of cases that deserve attention to see the benefits that we get from um, applying the technology uh, in, in, in many areas uh, of the economy. Uh, then uh, I'll try to present my understanding as a lawyer about NFTs and to be honest, I'll try and share my first uh, impression and understanding about uh, the value of NFTs uh, uh, for, the, for the market, uh, starting from digital art. Uh, I will also try to see beyond digital art and beyond digital artworks in order to understand better the, the, uh, the size uh, of this market and, and the possible benefits uh, that we can get. And uh, of course, I will conclude um, uh, explaining my understanding and my position so far that basically what we see happening uh, with NFTs is that we see uh, an exciting technology 
uh, that in the hands of some of the scammers, uh, we do not see anything other than some old scam tricks or scam activities. And uh, I will explain this through certain examples. And definitely it's not an exhaustive list of examples. Um, we can discuss later on uh, other cases possibly that you have seen and um, try to understand better uh, the regulatory developments and also the, the, uh, the reactions, I would say, from law enforcement agents so far. So starting uh, with asset tokenization uh, as, a, as a business trend, um, um, I have to say that perhaps there is no other technology giving so many uh, fantastic, great uh, results, especially when it comes to fundraising. Um, As a tokenization started from uh, real estate, predominantly real estate sector, uh, moving to energy, uh, shipping, um, uh, uh, environmental, many, many uh, sectors of the economy. We have seen a lot of our applications. There are a lot of use cases of, of blockchain technology that apply the concept of tokenization, which is basically um, the, the formula uh, to uh, divide uh, the asset, the value of, of an asset into uh, many uh, tokens and offer to the wider public a fraction of ownership to this asset. Uh, and this, along with the great momentum of digitalization and automation, gives this uh, market uh, liquidity and inclusivity. Uh, and apparently for, for the um, operators of these projects, uh, the owners of these projects, this gives this is uh, a super gateway to to uh, a larger pool of investors giving greater liquidity operational efficiency you can see uh, the key benefits um, of asset tokenization in this particular uh, slide so what we keep from this is the bigger picture of things and the the broader and uh, trend uh, towards asset tokenization. And this is important because now uh, we start, we should start looking at the new thing coming through NFTs. Uh, I think, and correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, I think that everything started, or at least the justification uh, that was given was to create something thanks to the technology that protect digital art. Uh, the, uh, the verification of ownership rights to a piece of digital art, it was and it is a very, very important part of, uh, the, of intellectual property law. So uh, it is something that at least at the beginning was approached as um, an attempt to uh, safeguard the rights, the ownership rights of people uh, creating orig original uh, art, uh, digital art. Um, the, what, we have, what we have to say here, all right, from, from a legal point of view, because it is a condition uh, for, for the protection of ownership is the originality of the work, all right? So, uh, apparently, uh, just taking a photo of Mona Lisa painting, uh, it does not give any sort of original work in order to deserve protection of ownership. Now, if you add a little bit of uh, magic and, and make it more digital, like the photo in the, in the middle here, uh, perhaps uh, there is some sort of creativity but I doubt whether this deserves the protection like any other uh, protection given to uh, an original work of art. Um, and uh, I go to the third photo, uh, this 
ugly photo, all right? Uh, and we have to say that, okay, if we isolate this third photo without looking at the other two photos, right? We hardly can see any connection maybe with Mona Lisa famous painting, right? So the question here is that someone uh, spent some time in front of his computer, right? Trying to create something that can be considered as creation of original work and therefore as piece of digital art deserves uh, protection. And if it does this uh, as an NFT, uh, then uh, we're talking about uh, the creation of a digital art that uh, what it gets as an attached uh, right to this as an attached data information is the proof of ownership of, of, for that digital painting, if we can say that. So um, here we can see how things evolve in terms of taking something that is purely uh, or, or digitalized compared to something that it is simple, a digital representation of an existing work, which I don't think and I do not agree that it gives any originality deserving protection. Um, so this is uh, what type of digital art uh, actually we're talking about, or at least lawyers understand as uh, NFT presented digital uh, art. Okay, so that was the first view of things, the first thing that we got uh, in the NFT market. The reality is that uh, it is not just a proof of ownership, right? The reality is that thanks to the, uh, to the technology and thanks to the ability of encoding uh, additional data information to this uh, digital file, all right, you get access or you are entitled to uh, many more rights that the owner can give uh, through the smart contract uh, of the NFT. And we have seen um, mostly um, rights given if you're in the gaming industry and you have uh, gaming cards, uh, NFTs, the owners, the holders of these NFTs to be given certain rewards, uh, early purchases rights, ex exclusive privileges, uh, the right to use a platform, a game, a product, a service. Uh, so we have seen a lot more than simply ownership verification. So that takes us definitely beyond digital artworks, and it is at the same time the beginning for the legal problems uh, in the area of NFTs. And I will, I will explain why. I will explain starting with uh, some extra uh, rights and, and, and facilities that uh, usually are given to NFT holders. And some of them uh, are displayed in this slide, such as voting rights, payment rights, uh, that take us to the edge of the legality uh, of certain actions. So my position, as I said uh, in my introduction today, is that uh, I'm not against uh, definitely NFTs. On the contrary, I can see a lot of value here, a lot of value from business perspective. Uh, but my position here is that don't expect, at least I do not expect, or I speak for myself, I do not expect to see any uh, different treatment or any different behavior uh, uh, in the market when it comes to um, illegal activities uh, or when it comes to um, actions that 
are questionable whether they are legitimate or not. Uh, because uh, it is true that uh, through the, uh, the cases that uh, we have seen so far across the globe, we haven't seen anything very anything new. Uh, uh, what we have seen is that uh, there is a simple uh, uh, enforcement of uh, traditional legal areas when it comes to the trading of NFTs, the sale of NFTs, um, anyone can say that uh, normal uh, rules, uh, uh, either this is in contract law or consumer law or property law are applicable here, all right? Of course, always there is a big question mark and a big, con uh, and a big concern for lawyers when it comes to jurisdictional issues, all right? Because here we're talking about something that is 100% online. And uh, usually there are, or well, unless it is specifically regulated in the terms and conditions of this transaction, uh, there are questions about which jurisdiction is, uh, governs uh, this transaction in case that something goes wrong and we need to go to the court. Of course, we haven't, uh, seen a lot of challenges, jurisdictional challenges so far, but I think it's a matter of time to, to come across this. So going back to uh, the traditional legal fields that are, uh, are more or less engaged with uh, NFT sales, uh, we have apparently intellectual property law that applies uh, quite extensively in this area. Uh, we have um, um, legislations, regulations coming from the broader security legal area that uh, need to be addressed uh, at all times and check out whether uh, what is being sold is a security or not. Because if we uh, reach the conclusion that an NFT uh, is classified as a security, then it's a totally different story then forget the simple contract law, consumer law, uh, all these uh, P2P, uh, let's say, uh, type of uh, transactions uh, in private law. Then we go to some very heavy regulations, meaning that if you do not follow these regulations, most likely you commit a crime and you've, uh, you are at risk to end up in, in prison. Uh, but uh, that's why you should uh, consider carefully uh, the possibility of any possible license that might be required when you conduct that business, selling of NFTs. Uh, and uh, definitely uh, there is always the red zone. Uh, you can see there are some not so pleasant uh, words that uh, unfortunately are always on the agenda. And I'm talking about a fraudulent uh, acts, uh, theft, money laundering, tax evasion, Ponzi schemes that unfortunately have been already associated sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly with the sale of NFTs. And let's have a look at certain examples now in order to um, uh, understand the position that here we actually uh, we are when it comes to these dodgy things and 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 the red zone, what we actually witness uh, are some financial fraud crimes that uh, have nothing to uh, nothing different from conventional uh, financial crimes uh, outside the crypto ecosystem. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with what is called as rug pull. Uh, there has been uh, a case, uh, and it's an ongoing case in the US. Uh, it's a criminal case uh, concerning the famous Frosty's NFT sale. Uh, there are some uh, indictments already issued um, in March this year, where basically, um, explain 
why the uh, why FBI and, and, and other law enforcement agents in in the U.S. have initiated investigations and uh, have brought into justice the founders of the first NFT sales, uh, describing this as yet another rug pull case where basically uh, what happens here is that uh, they create this hype about the, uh, the upcoming NFT sale and uh, usually engaging uh, some celebrities, uh, promising uh, something uh, extraordinarily well uh, that it will give a number of rewards, a number of uh, rights to, to the participants, to the, um, in this case, to the NFT holders. And all of a sudden, when the sale uh, is finished and they uh, get uh, the money that they, they asked for, in this case, they issued, uh, if I remember well, something around 11,000, uh, no, sorry, 8,000, something like this, NFTs. Uh, so they got the money and uh, all of a sudden they announced that, unfortunately, something went wrong and they will not implement the project and they got the money and disappear. Simple as that, all right? So you see that uh, starting with this example, don't expect to see, at least at the moment, any, any uh, more sophisticated than what we see normally in, this, um, in, in financial fraud uh, cases. Uh, last year, we had some um, uh, highlights uh, from the famous uh, board apes uh, collection and evolve apes um, i don't know again uh, if you're familiar with this but uh, we have uh, the case for instance uh, starting in october 2021 of, of evolve apes again the nft creator someone with the name evil ape okay so i don't know no, I know that a lot of people trust someone with the name evil, but anyway, that's another story. Anyway, the, the, the people here uh, in this um, uh, project, uh, they, they, they trusted uh, the potential of uh, the creation of a future uh, game, and uh, they rushed into buying these evolved eggs. They uh, injected something around $3 million to the evil and uh, surprisingly or not uh, uh, evil uh, got the money and disappeared with, and no gain uh, came into uh, uh, reality. So they ended up having just digital dust and nothing more than that, at least at the moment. I don't know if that is gonna change in the future, but that was again, simple as that the situation. And in the end of 2021, that is uh, a famous art collector galleries named Todd Kramer uh, from uh, New York uh, said that his digital wallet had been hacked and he lost all 15 NFTs that he bought um, uh, worth around $2.2 million. And uh, they, they, some, some internal investigations from OpenSea initiated. They presented this as a phishing scam, but anyway, the truth, the reality is that we had to do with something that looks exactly like any other theft, all right? Now, okay, it might look like any other theft. However, bear in mind that we're talking about technology and you know, I'm sure that you know from your own experience and your own background that here we're talking about something that when it comes to investigation and when it comes to the understanding of things, not many people uh, are familiar with these things. And this means that uh, uh, there, is no, there is not yet uh, so much expertise among law enforcement agents in order to trace appropriately these kind of scams and uh, do their job as they should do this, all right? So again, it is a very niche market, it's a developing market. So uh, that's why we um, sometimes it turn out to be a party for all scammers because of the lack of knowledge 
from the other side uh, on the, of the law enforcement agents. Another thing that uh, we witness happening uh, in NFTs is, is the so-called wash trading. So basically here we have a, uh, something like a fake news where uh, in the investment uh, language, wash trading is a process whereby a trader buys and sells uh, a security for the express purpose of uh, feeding misleading information to the market. So they create again this hype, they increase uh, the, um, uh, they present something as, as, as a valuable item why uh, it is not, uh, and uh, uh, by doing so, they they uh, they make uh, NFTs appear more valuable than uh, they actually are. And uh, coming to uh, my last couple of, of, of points, this is something also very interesting case that uh, I uh, I advise you to go and and, and read. Uh, unfortunately, it has a, a flavor of, of, of Cyprus from the scammers perspective or yeah, anyway, this is not very good for us. But anyway, that is uh, something that uh, concerns unlicensed security offerings as NFTs. It concerns uh, the announcement about uh, uh, an online casino, a virtual casino in Metaverse. Uh, two Cypro companies and their founders uh, issued 11,111 NFTs, offered them for sale, uh, promising to the NFT holders 50% of profits, uh, something around $80,000 per year. And before they go live, uh, SEC in the US, in Texas and Alabama, uh, accused them for selling unregistered uh, securities. And now they face um, uh, the possibility of, of imprisonment if they get them. Uh, and that takes us to the famous how test. I don't know if you remember this from the uh, period of, of ICOs when uh, the US authorities made it clear that no matter how you name it, if it is an ICO, token, a contribution, uh, NFT, name it as you like, if the sale uh, of that particular instrument satisfi satisfies the three-part test, investment of money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits, then it's qualified <clears throat> as a security and you have to uh, register this as security, otherwise stop, unless you want to get to prison. And uh, these issues, these, these uh, cases, and uh, the argument that uh, here we're talking about nothing extra sophisticated than any other uh, issue when it comes to financial fraud, uh, I think that brings into the table a, a very important thing that uh, a very important uh, topic for discussion and uh, at the same time for regulatory action, which is the NFT marketplaces. For those that uh, are familiar with the sole name VASP, Virtual Asset Service Providers, that is a term that at least in the European Union, it derives from the fifth anti-money laundering directive. And already we have uh, uh, for um, um, uh, uh, other global uh, law enforcement agents uh, speaking and uh, trying to uh, regulate the activities of VASP. Anyway, the point here is that uh, if you are a company that you are considered as virtual asset service provider and you provide any of these activities that you can see in this slide, then you are considered as obliged entity, meaning that you have the obligation uh, to report, first of all, to apply enhanced due diligence during the acceptance policy, the acceptance of any new client. So your acceptance policy standards for new crypto clients should be the maximum that exists 
starting from know your client policies, but also transaction monitoring for his crypto transactions. So you need to have in place the proper tools monitoring whether your client is involved in any uh, risky or uh, uh, problematic, let's say, transactions deserving extra um, justification and reporting from, from himself in One order to minute. avoid money laundering. One more minute, Harris. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm finishing. Yeah, so um, as an obliged entity, uh, uh, they have to apply these strict criteria for their clients, but also they have to undertake uh, on, a, on a very, very frequent um, basis, uh, the reporting towards their supervisors, the, the, the regulatory authorities in their home countries, in order to maintain their license if they want to continue to be virtual asset service providers. The problem here with NFTs is that NFT marketplaces are not in the list of obliged entities. At least there is no positive law uh, uh, asking from NFT marketplaces to be registered and licensed to provide this service. And this brings them outside the scope of obliged entities, outside the obligation uh, of uh, performing this uh, task as I have just uh, explained to you. So thank you very much. Uh, we have plenty of things to, to discuss. I'm sure about this uh, later on in the, in the panel discussion. Uh, so I hope you, uh, I was quick, but I think that uh, I hope you find it uh, interesting. Thank you very much, Harris. It was very interesting indeed. Soon we will start our panel discussion. And I just want to check if Kletos is here. Yes, Kletos is here. Hello, Kletos. Um, Dr. Kletos, Christo. Hello, hello. hello. Hi. Hi. I'm here. <laughs> Let me switch my camera. Okay, please do. Can uh, see me as well. So Kletos, would you mind to say 10 second introduction about you being the panel member? Of course. Uh, first of all, uh, nice to meet you all and uh, it's my pleasure to be online. Uh, my name is Kyrgios Christodoulou and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nicosia. I'm also part of the uh, Digital Innovation Department and I'm also uh, the research manager of the Institute for the Future. So nice okay. to meet you. Thank you. And your area of work is blockchain, is that correct? Exactly, yes. Uh, I've been working mostly on data management issues on blockchains uh, for the past um, four years. Okay. Uh, therefore, my main domain of research is currently blockchains uh, from the protocol level uh, towards uh, smart contracts uh, and data management on, on blockchains. Okay, good. Thank you. So I think the question, we have got several questions. So I'm going to pick some of them within the time. Uh, I'm conscious it's getting a bit late for some of us. Um, first is, can the IRS track NFTs, are NFTs subject to US money laundering regulations? I think probably to you, Harris. Um, yeah, um, well, definitely uh, everything, everything is subject to AML check, right? Uh, so uh, this is not an exception, uh, no matter in what jurisdiction you are in, something, um, is used mm -hmm. for 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 money laundering money laundering purposes. Uh, apparently, uh, it gives the authority the, the 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 right to the authorities to to monitor this and check this out. Uh, what it is important to address as a distinction here is that it is one thing to. Uh, having something, uh, let's say, have a business that uh, is not obliged to report for its business for money laundering purposes. And it is totally different when the, the report, the, there is a reporting obligation anyhow. 
So uh, in the first case, you simply wait until they catch you. In the second case, <laughs> actually what happens is that you take, um, um, you declare whatever you declare, and if you fail to declare uh, appropriately your business, so you try to hide something, uh, then it's it's much serious problem, and it feels like you try to cheat. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me bring in another aspect. You talked about government. We talked about regulation, and I think Andrea talked about challenges in implementing NFT as well. But how how about lack of understanding, lack of awareness? of the users, people, general investors, public, who gets excited about the value or potential from NFT. And they started investing small amount of money, but for them, that's very valuable, very important. How do we protect them? And how do we develop next generation of NFTs, which could be less risky for them? Who wants to take it? Andrea, do you have any comments or tweeters? I mean, the value, especially in the in the realm of art, the value of an NFT as the value of art is purely conventional, right? Caravaggio disappeared for 500 years. Mona Lisa was in the basement of Louvre for two centuries. Uh, therefore, it, it, it's a very difficult exercise of because one could try and say uh, educate but the problem is uh, educate on what we really don't know what's the future of these nfts it's very likely that there has been a bubble and now we are start seeing a correction we have no clear idea of what happens when a bubble like this explodes because while cryptos are fungible and so they all lose the same amount at least within one crypto here we don't know so probably the education should be on the fact that this is an extremely high risk and volatile market, which on the other one, on the other hand is exactly why people get excited. So it's- uh, uh -huh. Thank you. Just to add to what uh, Andrea mentioned, uh, which I, I, fully, I fully agree on. Um, so first piece of advice is do your own research, right? And in order to do your own research, as with any investment, let's say, if we, if we look at it from an investment perspective, you need to be aware of the risks. So uh, first of all, the, the, I think the, uh, the users, the, the investors, they need to understand the risks that are coming from the smart contracts, first of all. For example, uh, you know, the, the various phishing scams that could be implemented or the bugs that could be uh, introduced within, uh, within a smart contract that could cause a loss of your investment, let's say. Uh, also, the, the technology itself has several challenges, managing your keys, interacting with smart contracts, signing transactions. All this, this is new terminology for users, for investors. Therefore, education is, has, uh, makes sense uh, just first of all, to start from what's blockchains, how do they work, and how do they differ from, from other, you know, uh, systems, let's say. So um, definitely, I think that um, education in, in this respect, I mean, to understand that technology is really important for both investors, but also for the regulators, which I, I think that even the regulators, sometimes they, they have, you know, some difficulties in understanding of what they, they are trying to regulate on. A lot, so a lot, think, a lot thank of you. <laughs> so, so I, I think that uh, both technical people and regulators, they need to, uh, you know, uh, support education in this front and uh, educate people so that they, they are equipped with at least the basic knowledge to perform their own research before they invest. That's, that's my advice. Thank you, Plutus. Um, quite a few questions, but let me pick one of them. Can we actually link a physical sculpture with NFT 
Can an NFT be used to transmit the right of property of this physical sculpture? One question for clarification. Where, where is the original work here? No, I think the original work is, I'm, well, I'm assuming the question is asked by the original owner and he or she wants to, and Hosu, um, do you want to come in? Um, do you want to clarify? Are you the owner? Yes, in the real world, physical world. So basically the question is about if we know the owner of a physical object like a sculpture, which is original sculpture, can we link NFT with it to protect its identity so that we can prove its authenticity? That would be, uh, for me, that would be great, all right? Um, I'm not aware of any, of, of any such case anywhere in the world yet. However, it is true that um, if, uh, if you have a real sculpture, right? Mm -hmm. And actually uh, you want to create a digital replicate of yeah. this sculpture, right? And make it as, as NFT, all right? Uh, I understand that the reason why you want to do this is to um, somehow try and connect the original work between the two worlds as a verification process uh, in order to make it uh, crystal clear to everyone that you are the owner. And start trading this also uh, in the digital world. Um, yeah, exactly, okay. So yeah, I call you right. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because, but it is very interesting. It is very interesting. Yeah, it, I've heard that. I've heard, I've heard about sculptures creating the, a, a 3D image, right? So uh, I heard that uh, in the past as, as an idea. I'm not so sure about the legal answer for this. Okay. Any other comments, colleagues? Uh, Andrea? Well, yeah, I mean, in, in the ownership of a flat now is, is such because there is a database with the government recognizes that says that you own that flat. So with the, uh, as it was said now, if the regulation would give this to a blockchain database or in case NFTs, this would be possible. There are however experiments already with physical objects Adidas, for example, in the metaverse, uh, using some uh, release virtual objects, but if you have the NFT of the virtual object, then you can claim the physical equivalent in the real world. So seen as a ticket, this works. Of course, the legal aspect is key. So will a judge recognize that as a proof of ownership? But mm -hmm. in this, in this context, just to conclude, it is not so different uh, a physical sculpture from a picture because also the picture is stored in some hard disk somewhere. And actually this is a, a main problem. So it's not inside the smart contract. So if, if the ownership of the digital object is recognized somehow, then also the physical. Okay, okay, thank you. Now, I think I'm reaching the final question. I'm a crypto artist and I'm really concerned about how to protect my artworks. There are a lot of scams. I mean, some people are literally stolen artworks to artists, stoking their identities, selling their identities, theft of identities. Don't you think that NFT marketplaces should ensure the identity of artists? I mean, the KYC process should be obliged for creators or buyers. I mean, don't you think that there are bots buying and selling and manipulating the market? So quite a bit of challenging questions here. Who wants to go first? Let, let, me, let me try to, let me attempt yes, at least to uh, yeah. shed some light uh, on this. First of all, uh, the, the first part of the question somehow relates to the previous one. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, blockchains are used as an attestation layer, let's say, of, of digital objects. So uh, in order to relate a digital artifact, let's say, to the owner, somehow this needs to be exposed. And the way that I see this in the future is that uh, our, I, our human identities will be linked or related uh, to some digital, let's say, human uh, identity, perhaps in DIND or some, some kind of decentralized identi identity. Mm -hmm. And this, this will be used to make the attestations that our digital objects, the, the ones that we own or create, belong to, to us. And by using cryptography, uh, another user can audit and, and verify the, uh, let's say, the authenticity of the item. And this will become, you know, much more clearer when we, if we assume a future where uh, every object has its digital twin, and, and I'm referring to the to the general vision of the spatial web, where we imagine that uh, the real uh, layer of the real world uh, somehow links to some digital layer of, you know, uh, our virtual, let's say, presence. Um, and and the last part of the question, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I think the last question uh, was about um, the KYC process should be obliged for creators and buyers. I yes. Mean, don't you think there is bots buying? So it's about. Yeah, yeah, definitely so, bots are buying and selling. It's something that is happening all of the time in NFT marketplaces um, uh, with, with DINDs. Uh, the wallet addresses will be somehow linked to the to the identity, and therefore, yeah, to, by performing AML checks, you can verify whether uh, a non-custodial wallet belongs to some real world entity or uh, it doesn't belong to uh, or belongs to the board or whatever. So Thank yeah, uh, that's very important, and it should be implemented. Thank you very much, colleagues. With that. Let me summarize with very few words. I know it's, um, we are getting close to finish line now. First of all, thank you very much all for coming. We had at some point over 325 people attending this webinar. Thank you to the speakers and panel members. What we have done today is essentially started a dialogue with some experts and colleagues who are interested in NFT. Certainly, the interest is growing rapidly across the world. But along with that, we need to understand real risks and regulatory framework that must come, that must be developed parallelly rather than as an afterthought. I think this is important to protect public, to protect the investors who doesn't have the resources of big investors who can do research, who can study themselves and have a team of people out advising them. We have to protect them against new technologies like NFT. But end of the day, with better knowledge and better checks and balances, we should be able to benefit from such developments going forward. With that, thank you again for all of you to come. And on behalf of UNIC, University of Nicosia and City University of London, I want to thank you all and have a good evening. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.